<clears throat> oh, we did it. Thank you. So I'm very excited to share with you, and I, I don't know how many people are online, if anybody, but want to make sure that um, uh, I explain this front slide. I presented preliminary findings at the Association of Municipalities of Ontario in August. They're called preliminary findings. I've since gone through the 42 transcripts, um, done the data memoing and the analysis, and the preliminary findings still hold. But the manuscript is under development and about to be submitted, so I'm presenting something that says preliminary findings so that I'm not uh, shooting myself in the foot. <laughs> Okay, so uh, in terms of what we're going to talk about in terms of campuses, just out of curiosity, who here has heard about a senior's campus before? All one of you? Okay, um, excellent. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it then. In terms of the seniors campus model that's in Ontario, that was the focus of this particular research, and they've been around for about I don't know, 30, 40 years in various different configurations. And this has been something that Advantage Ontario has been supporting members who offer campuses to try and um, do well in offering a continuum of care. And they identified this as a strategic priority at the same time that I was doing research on campuses. So it seemed to be a good fit and we were able to uh, successfully get a CIHR fellowship to do that work. So in terms of how campuses came to be, I'll explain them in, in more detail in just a moment. Um, but when you think about most people wanting to age in place in their own communities, but we seem to have a supply issue. So it's not just access, it's not just availability, there's also a lack of innovation sometimes and trying to think through how we can offer care to people in their place of choice and to their own care choices as well. Uh, so the drivers would be individual drivers wanting to age in their own community. There's also organizational drivers that we want to make sure that we're doing better with our warm handoffs and transitioning people so that's a good transition. But even system level drivers because if we're well supporting people in the community for a long period of time and we're not using institutional long-term care as our trajectory as the one and only place that people end up eventually and that's institutional being long-term care or hospital we're thinking more creatively about how we can offer that care. If we have people in the right places in the system, we don't have higher costs. We can either have cost neutral or lower costs. So a lot of governments, not just in, in Canada, but across jurisdictions, are looking at ways to try and integrate care and offer more seamless um, coordination of care for both the person who is in need of some sort of health or social care, but also their caregivers. Uh, in terms of, of Advantage Ontario, when I arrived there to do this study, we did a scan of how many of their members were currently offering campuses, and I'll describe them in just one moment, campuses being um, offering a blend of mixed income housing with community supports and with institutional long-term care on one site. Sometimes these campuses even include hospital care if they're run by a hospital. So uh, out of that particular definition, having four components being community internally to the campus residents, but also externally to uh, residents that live in the broader community. And that would be an example of the campus may be the provider of Meals on Wheels, or the campus may be the provider of a preventative falls program that people come in from the community to take advantage of or congregate dining, volunteer experiences, wellness centers like a pool. So in terms of those types of definition, that definition, the types of campuses that we were able to see were 34 or 35 campuses. So in terms of the actual definition that we used for this research was sometimes it's a single organization that can offer a campus, but often it's also a formal collaboration of a number of different providers. And they can be health providers and they can also be social service providers. Because when we think about health, just a question for you, when you think about health, what percentage of your health is all biomedical and what percentage is more social determinants of health? When you think about that, I mean, we're, I'm in a social work department here. 
<laughs> what do you think? What primarily contributes to your health? The social determinants of health. So housing and education and finances and a whole, whole realm of things. So in terms of these campuses, when I mentioned that there was mixed income housing, that would mean social housing, which is rent geared to income. There's often affordable housing offered at these campuses, which is about 80% of market rent. Then there'd be fair market rent. And then there would be other options, something like condos or life leases. In terms of the shared geographic co-location of these services, they would also be doing different levels of care for people. So um, particularly if you think of spouses moving in where one spouse has higher needs than another, uh, they have the ability through different programs like supportive housing, et cetera, to ratchet services up or down depending on need, but also help bring them to different programs that they offer internally. Some even had a retirement home. So here are the key components again that I mentioned. The study that I looked at is when a, when a campus had long-term institutional care as well as different mixed housing options and then community programs and supports internally and externally. These slides are available in a link that I'll share with Susan and then so you can write down anything you want but I will make them available to you uh, on the AMO website. So as I mentioned, there are these different types of housing opportunities that people might access at these campuses, and many of them are run by municipalities. Um, but I also looked at not-for-profit. I didn't look at for-profit because the association I was embedded in uh, was a not-for-profit association that works with charitable not-for-profits and municipalities. That being said, there are a number of campuses that are offered by for-profits, but they tend to be um, institutional long-term care, community services, and retirement home options. You won't normally see um, social housing or affordable housing. So in terms of the literature, there wasn't a lot in the literature to speak about this type of model. You hear about care continuums, but the geographic co-location of all of these particular components in one place was really hard to find. There was some literature in the States, but they were based on life care continuums with work pretty much algorithms, uh, people moving into a center and then you will spend this much time in dependent living and then we will move you to this and you're gonna get supportive housing and then you're gonna go here and you're gonna have long-term care and you cannot go backwards, you just always go forwards on that trajectory. So we didn't include those. So now the fun part. We looked at what factors influence the evolution and ongoing functioning of seniors' campuses because again, with little research out there, we wanted to at least know some of their history in addition to what keeps them sustainable. Okay, for the academics in the room, this is pretty exciting and may leave this for Q&A because I'm guessing you want to get right to the results. In terms of selection, it felt like I was on The Bachelor because I had 34 expressions, or sorry, I sent out to 34 different associate members, organizations that had campuses, would you like to be part of the study? 16 said, yes, please count me in, and I was only supposed to do four. Then I was kind of convinced that I should do six so that we could do three municipal and three not-for-profit. A lot of data, embarrassment of riches. So we looked at different provider types. We looked at the different geography. So we had urban, we had rural, and we had northern. We had different campus sizes. We had unique populations that were represented. And I say unique, which is interesting, because when, when the findings came in, it turned out that we really had a lot of homogeneous populations because some of the campuses were faith-based organizations or had a foundation from a faith-based organization pushing for them to be built. Uh, and we also had diversity in how long they've been um, as the four components together. What's interesting about this particular uh, case comparison is that Toronto Research Ethics, anybody has had to go through that particular ethics committee, they were horrified that I was going to identify the names of the campuses. And which is interesting because you're working as an embedded researcher in an organization and as soon as you say we want to highlight you know, your campus in a study, yeah, put my name on it, we're so proud of our work, we're okay with this. I had to convince with lots of paperwork and lots of signing of confidentiality agreements that you may be referred to as senior leadership at X campus or a partner at of this campus and they were completely fine with that. They they 
felt that if there was something that they weren't proud of, that it would be a learning opportunity, but they, they really were quite okay with having their name shared. In reporting back, though, I've done as much aggregate as possible. So interestingly, I haven't identified anybody for the first manuscript yet. So in terms of a little bit of feel for what these campuses look like, Spruce Lodge is one of the oldest ones, and it's probably one of the most innovative I've ever seen. It's fantastic. I'll say that about all of them, actually, how fantastic they are. Uh, it has a long-term care home. And you know, with this particular campus, what they said is back in the uh, 80s, they said, you know, people are driving to nursing home care. They obviously need some sort of other option. And so what they did is they invested and they built apartments. So there were people who didn't necessarily need full-time nursing care of a nursing home, but what they did need is they needed a housing option with monitoring and supports and perhaps a good meal here and there. So they have different apartment towers. They also thought, okay, well, we need another income stream because we have mostly rent geared to income. So they brought in Hamlet Estates, which was a life lease situation where people can actually buy a property and then they sell it back to the organization. They don't actually keep it. You can't have your children move in. Um, which is quite interesting because for those it's a different age criteria. So senior campuses tends to be 65 and over, but if you're buying life lease, it's 50 or 55 and over. Um, so what's interesting is I'm soon able to move on to a campus if I want to. Uh, and here is stock photo, of, uh, two stock photos of Spruce Lodge because my camera died on that day, unfortunately. It's quite beautiful in real life. Uh, Au Chateau amazing another amazing campus built in the 1960s first with long-term care also felt we need some housing units and there was a real need to meet francophone speaking services so they are an actual design no they are not designated but all of their staff speak french and it was really driven by uh, the catholic community it was a, a priest and local counselors that said we need to get this built and so they have a unique arrangement uh with the city to, um, there's me at the Last Supper at the bottom. Uh, we have condos in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, and we have the apartment living in the top right-hand corner of the screen, just as examples. They actually uh, have an, a bona fide parish, even though they're not a faith-based campus, uh, but they have a campus with a, the, a priest that used to live on site. Georgian Village is the newest. It was just built in 2013. It's pretty brain spanking new and impressive. If you ever want a tour, they're so happy to give them. All of them are, but particularly this one because it's so new and shiny. They too have an interesting large Francophone population, but what was different about this population is they also had a lot of Métis folks. And what was nice is uh, in Penetanguishing, uh, they've done a lot to try and uh, work around the, the Indigenous community and make sure that they feel comfortable in a campus setting. Uh, they also had a very supportive council, and uh, here's some folk, uh, some photos of the top right or top left-hand corner is the long-term care home, and it looks like a fancy resort. Uh, it looks nice inside too. Uh, the one on the bottom left are the condos that have, or the apartments that have balconies, and um, what do you call a rotunda or something where people go. Uh, Briere Village is in Ottawa, and it's attached to a hospital, so there are some interesting policy implications for being attached to a hospital and having to meet long-term care guidelines and hospital guidelines and housing guidelines. I'm just going to get to the pictures because you get the idea of the different ways that these can be configured. Um, also had a very strong, strong history with the Catholic Church, even though it's not a faith-based campus. And Radiant Care Pleasant Manor was actually started by the Mennonite population down in Virgil, Ontario, which is close to Niagara on the lake. So it's a nice, tiny, well, not so tiny anymore, but it was very, very tiny at the time. And that was the opposite. That was where there was housing built. And they realized, what are we going to do? We don't want to move to Niagara Falls or we don't want to move to St. Catharines. We want to be able to have some services nearby. And so what they did is they built long-term care alongside of their housing units and then they just kept building housing and housing and housing which has been really well received and they just received more funding for redevelopment. So you'll see um, bottom left is their their administration offices, the top left is long-term care and to the right hand side are some of the original rent geared to income that they've taken on and kept as rent geared to income after the 40 or 50 year mortgages were done. Okay, so, oh and Shalom Village. 
uh, which was fun to visit because I had been there when I was a McMaster student doing my placement. And this one was where a bunch of um, faith leaders in the community said, you know, why do we have to move to Toronto to have our culture and our food requirements met? And so they created uh, their own mini Baycrest, shall we say, in, in Hamilton. And they started uh, as a home for the aged and then moved outward into housing and, and long-term care. And here are some pictures. They have a synagogue actually inside of Shalom Village and they have a, a rabbi that they keep on staff. Okay, so in terms of some of the commonalities across campuses, and please put up your hand if you have any questions as we're going through. Uh, they've grown organically to the needs of the communities. They have often used long-term care bed licenses as anchors to build because that provides infrastructure to build other things. So if you're already paying to have an environmental services person or you have to follow certain requirements, you have a large kitchen, then you can start doing other things with that at some economies of scale. They had, as I mentioned, historical and lasting connections to a lot of different faith communities and neighborhood groups and visionary leaderships that were willing to take a chance and put their name to million dollar mortgages. Um, in terms of all of them, they, they did some sort of gap analysis, some were more elaborate than others. And they went through multiple hoops to try and make it because they believed in the vision of having people being able to age in their own community and have options for different kinds of housing and social supports. Sorry that the bottom point is very difficult to see. I don't know why it's distorting. So in terms of implementation and ongoing management, they were designed with physical linkages. And what was really fascinating about this, uh, I want you to think about so did anybody here go to university and live in dorm? Live all two of you? Okay. Um, so I'll try and think of another. Has anybody been on a cruise ship before? Okay. I'm getting half the room now. Um, in terms of connectivity, having something where you don't have to go outside if you don't need to was really considered beneficial, not only for 30 above degree weather and 30 below degree weather, because sometimes you don't want to be able to have to or have to put on your boots. Um, but it also really helped foster this village feel because if you wanted to get exercise, you would be walking through long term care. You might be going through a retirement home. You might be going through community. And many of them actually have when we look at amenities, um, restaurants and hair salons, etc. So that physical connectedness really helped with the community and social connectedness as well. In terms of the um, central administration that certainly helped because there was a point person that people really felt that they could go to who they trust. And again, in a faculty of social work, you know the value of having that point person who's got your back. And so really having, having faces that were familiar and very accessible because because these were often done piecemeal, administration was often right in the middle of a, a hallway that where people were receiving um, uh, living or receiving care. So there was a really good opportunity for a lot of interconnectivity. Um, and, and often staff were volunteering and treating people like family. In fact, many of the staff had family living in campuses as well. Um, and that was because, um, because of local proximity, but because they, they felt that the type of holistic care and being able to go through a continuum was really meeting their needs. So what many people have done is they've created a fundraising arm to try and contribute back and also created a really great opportunity for volunteerism. So when you have the connectivity across the campus, that means that a spouse can go and visit their husband in the long-term care home, but they can also do other volunteer work and uh, it's really been able to help with um, rummage sales, you name it, bake sales, um, golf tournaments, etc. They have a lot of different governance models, um, and I'm, I'm not sure that that's something we want to spend our time on. I think we should get right to programs and services. If you think about um, how many people in the room have heard about supportive housing, do you know about housing with supports that are offered through the government? Yeah. So when you have that kind of program, it allows you to have access to help if you are in an emergency or you're feeling sick uh, 24 hours, seven days a week. And the new assisted living policy is what has replaced the old supportive housing. 
There are other models too that are pretty fantastic out there called Cluster Living, which is very similar to the Greenhouse Project. I don't know if you've heard about uh, Bill Thomas's Greenhouse Project for dementia. And this is, I guess, similar to retirement home where you'd have your own apartment with little kitchenette, but you come out for congregate meals. Uh, so Cluster Living would have three congregate meals. What was interesting, Briere offers Cluster Living and they got their hands slapped because they were offering meals that clients themselves help to help to make. Now, wouldn't you think that would be something that would be, I mean, we hear all the time that that's so beneficial to people. So they're in their own apartment. They're not in a long-term care home. They're helping to contribute, but public health said, nope, you have to order the food from the kitchen at the long-term care home so that there are regulations that are controlling it. Okay. So what they did is they made a negotiation where every breakfast clients can make their own breakfast, but they can't make their lunch or dinner. You go figure. Anyways, uh, so I ate meals in every one of the, the campuses and I was served the most lovely breakfast by a francophone lady who didn't understand no in either language. And, um, <laughs> and it was a really, really wonderful experience to, um, to really get resident perspective when I wasn't allowed to interview them specifically but get a feel for it every time i sat at these meals and i would ask them well what do you think of campus living this is what my research is on oh i love it this i don't know what i would have done without it i still have my independence my family is so happy um, because they don't have to be checking on me all the time all the things we hear about things that are one-offs like supportive housing or retirement living but here what they felt is that they really had an opportunity to develop social capital and to, to support one another and they were having potlucks with each other they were using communal space that uh, that physical connectivity every single floor of the independent living had some sort of way to connect either doing a puzzle together or baking or cooking or they had salads, raised beds. And every one of the campuses did something to that effect. It was pretty phenomenal. And I attribute a lot of that to the village feel and the atmosphere, that people have the ability to take something on. Uh, if you think of your own local community, do you ever have a corn roast in your local community? Do you have, do you have activities? So they were able to take it on and have a little support to make it really happen. The recreation opportunities, I, wherever there was a pub night, I hit one. And they were fantastic because they would have a communal space where people from every place on that campus, whether you were in independent living, whether you were in some sort of supported living, even long-term care, it was often hosted in long-term care actually, um, retirement, there was a way to have some sort of communal gathering of all the different parts so that you wouldn't feel that you were partitioned, partitioned off. Oh, that's the retirement home. Oh, that's the person in long-term care. They'd bring in entertainment. And one company, one organization in particular, um, they, they didn't have enough space for everybody to participate. So they made the rule that if you want to participate in any of this, you need to bring somebody from long-term care with you. So that was an interesting uh, tool to try and get people to actively volunteer in that particular place because it was a strongly francophone Catholic population. You'd see families that would have 10 in their family and then cousins. And so that wasn't a hard to go find somebody in the long-term care and enjoy a good night. Um, and it really helped keep that connectivity. In terms of the active living centers, they also often were community hubs that would offer pools and um, gyms and programs and and there was a real mix of whether or not that was actively used by the community i mean one community uh, had a wait list for their gym and another one had to sell memberships and they really couldn't even get enough memberships to support it the other amenities though was the interesting partnership um, they would bring in things like uh, an audiology clinic or a, a blood lab service, all these things so that if people have difficulty with transportation, whether it's negotiating it or even affording it, they would do some um, enterprise leasing. So yes, people would pay rent to be there, but they would have pretty much a guaranteed clientele to be there. And you were actually saving people the hassle of having to go to the hospital hospital or to a lab somewhere else to go and, and, and get either a, a medical check or blood work, um, pharmacy, etc. Another one had a public library right on, on site where the broader community could come in and check out books just like you would the normal system. They did a lot to try and foster that, but guess what the biggest problem, problem at every campus was when you started expanding scope and allowing more and more activity from the broader community? 
It happens in every organization. Not enough space. Not enough space, but not enough parking. So they had the space, they didn't have enough parking. So then they were getting in trouble because people were parking illegally on streets and then they were getting in trouble. And um, so, so this, it's, you know, again, the embarrassment of riches. We have all these great opportunities, but we don't have anywhere for people to park. Um, the, the problem about using this particular slide deck is it doesn't have one of the most important partnerships. And if you can think about it, who do you think one of the most important partners is in trying to make something like this work? Big funder and a, a big regulator would be the, the ministry. So the ministry should have been probably the first point up there. And it's not just the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, but the Ministry of Housing as well. Uh, so they're an important partner. The LINS, of course. Now, if you think about colleges and universities, can I plant a seed? You, if you want, have great, wonderful, rich environments beyond just going to a standalone long-term care home, which is great, standalone supportive housing. But when you go to something for training um, and research purposes like a campus, you get to get a whole gamut of different types of programming <clears throat> and, and uh, experiences to, to research and participate in. They found that... Um, <clears throat> there is a PSW shortage, you've probably heard. There's a nursing shortage. So with the HR shortages, what they found is actually being training sites for local colleges and universities was really helping to try and not only recruit, but even screen to say, is that a person we really want that would fit well here, etc. <clears throat> school boards, how fascinating. They worked with school boards as well for fire drills where students would come and then we didn't have to use real residents to for places like the long-term care home and um, so that was a really interesting way to, to, to move forward. The volunteerism, it really is something that um, was well fostered. So you can have a great idea and you can work at it but a number of these campuses were working around multiple siloed pieces of legislation. And if you think about that cluster care example I gave you, just even trying to make your own meal in shared living space, frankly, how ridiculous is that? Like, it's ridiculous. And so trying to meet public health and ministry of labor and, you know, there, there are things that everybody has to meet if you have an organization. This room, this building has to follow building codes and fire codes, et cetera. Absolutely. Think about your own home. What if you were supposed to have somebody come and inspect and make sure you met every code and that you, you know, the way you were preparing your meals was just so and that it was this particular temperature when you were going to eat it. Um, so people often felt a little bit overregulated, even in the non long term care home portions. Um, but it was done so well by staff that the staff turnover was virtually zero. These places were able to keep people, uh, which really helped with the shortage. Uh, in terms of labor laws, multiple unions, but funnily enough, they it didn't really pose a problem um, when you were trying to think about creative ways of crossing over from long-term care to retirement. Um, it did it did mean that you probably had to have separate cons. Yeah, that's fabulous. Where there was really no need to have separate cons. Yeah. 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 Well, here's a fun story. So. This is being recorded, but I don't know if the question would have been heard. Should I repeat the question? Okay, so in terms of is the pay different in a campus? The pay, just like out in, the, out in other areas, tends to be higher in long-term care homes. But if you think, of, if you think about what happens with um, long-term care right now, what are the ratios in, in long-term care? I, I will get to your answer in just a minute. What are the ratios? One PSW to how many residents generally? 10 to 15? Okay. If you are a personal support worker working in the housing component of a campus, what's your ratio? Generally one on one or one on two if you're working with a couple at one time in terms of responsibility. So yes. The, the wages were often higher in long-term care, but a lot of people who had seniority, this was one of the union issues, a lot of people with seniority with the organization wanted to move into the housing component because they liked the ratio of having the one-on-one. -on -one. And so um, when you're talking about an HR shortage, 
and you create housing and then you steal from yourself. It was it was something they had to deal with and figure out creative ways of letting people work in both areas. Um, so the other thing is a lot of people were, yes, the, it may be a dollar more to work in long-term care than in the community, but many of the people had to piece together two part-time jobs. And so they were willing to take something a little more full-time in the community at less money uh, than in the long-term care homes. So um, yes, long-term care does pay more. The housing can pay more, but you go down if you're, if because the rules are different about PSWs and RPNs and RNs in the different settings. So that's one of the siloed legislative pieces that, that if there's no universal worker. The greenhouse project that uh, Bill Thomas has created, though, looks at Shabazz, which is supposed to be a universal worker that takes on all of the different different types of elements. One of the interesting things that uh, one of the campuses did is now they hire in the community in the independent living supportive housing programs, they hire DSWs. Um, that's out of Algonquin College and they're developmental support workers and they actually have two years of college training versus um, three to six months of a PSW and they get counseling. They also get um, education and developmental disabilities, which a lot of these campuses housed older adults that had some sort of developmental delays or physical disabilities. So, uh, interesting, because <clears throat> being a health policy wonk, if you look there at that bullet that says Lynn supportive housing and assisted living policies, I was all across Ontario and every Lynn interpreted their, their support housing and assisted living programs differently. So that meant that in some places there was some creative license taken by the campuses and in others they followed it to the T and if a person came on and needed services, I'm sorry, you're going to have to hire privately from the community outside. What's interesting with the, uh, the staffing shortage, some agencies that are in the community that are trouble recruiting and say they're supposed to go onto the campus and provide some care, they're now subcontracting campus staff to be there they're um, formerly CCAC, they're Lynn Home Care Providers. So it's just fascinating, the interconnectivity. And of course, clients love that because then they have familiar faces that they may have been paying privately on a campus. So I don't understand. You have person A who normally works on the campus. Right. This is in their extra off time that they work as a subcontractor for a private agency? How does that work? Yes. Yeah, two separate contracts. So very good question. Yes. And of course, when you are working in different areas and for different programs, then you get into issues of overtime and you have to be really careful of that too. So these campuses, they seem very simple. Let's co-locate a number of different components because it's good for the clients, it's good for people, it's good for the organization, but it means a lot of workarounds and really figuring out how that's going to affect and Im implicate um, some of their policies. That being said, there's a real push right now to try and build more because what they see, uh, Briere, for example, the reason why they created housing is they saw that there were a lot of people in their hospitals and they said, we're in the business of aging. We already have a long-term care home. We have tons of ALC beds and they're primarily filled with people who can't, they don't necessarily need long-term care, but they can't go home because they don't have the supports. So they figured if two thirds of their clientele were actually seniors in need of these kinds of supports, um, meaning long-term care and housing, that this really followed the mandate of what they created in the first place. And so they built the housing. So when, when people are in ALC, and you've heard of the alternative level of care crisis, alternative level of crisis beds in the hospital, am I talking language that so with that particular um, issue with alternative level of care beds, um, sometimes people need extra support that the former CCAC cannot offer. And so they, they say, well, then their safest place is to be in an institutional long-term care home bed. But what they found is that campuses offer different levels of support up to, and quite often people with the same scores the same maple scores that you're getting for placement in long-term care, but offering that kind of care in a person's own home. So when you're offering both and you see that the care needs are often the same for long-term care and somebody who's in an assisted living program, it's hard not to argue when you're talking about $60 a day versus 
a lot more. Uh, so they also really improve independence and social capital and connectedness. Um, in terms of reducing social isolation, there are still the people, like my mother, she's a hermit. She would not want to be out there doing all those wonderful cooking classes and what have you. But it would be nice for her to know that she could if she wanted to. The other thing is every single campus offers the opportunity for congregate dining. And some it's mandatory where you buy a service package and you get you have to have purchased, say, 16 meals, for example. And that allows for some eyeballs on a person to make sure that they're doing OK. And sure, they can eat it in their, their apartment, but they have to come down to get it. Um, so there's a, a way to try and to look at uh, um, maintaining opportunities to be active throughout their lifespan. In terms of creating this service continuum, uh, having access to 24-7, sometimes it's just peace of mind. If you think of people that have some mental health issues or mild cognitive impairment, they may not need the intensive services of a long-term care home, but they may need to have the security of a, a secure environment, not meaning secure that the doors are locked, because that was one of the, the issues as well. But to be able to have people monitoring and keeping an eye of all, you know, one person I remember I asked flat out, I said, is that person not a, a wandering risk? And they're like, nope, has never tried to leave because we've created this community that they feel safe in. And so hopefully that person never does try to leave or other people, but um, they've done some really amazing things. The benefits also to the organization, to the system, well, and to the client, when you have economies of scale, think about, okay, so the converter is often a difficult thing for people, right? You can figure out your TV, your con converter, your television, your internet. So having an actual organization take care of all of that for you uh, as part of your rent is pretty nice for some people. I know that that would be great for my mother-in-law. Uh, in terms of um, improving care coordination, there's the formal care coordination, and then there's also the informal care coordination. If you think about coming and living under landlord tenancies, well, there's no obligation for my landlord to keep an eye on me. But if I'm living on a campus, it happens indirectly and informally. And it also helps to make referrals for when I do need some help. It also helps with uh, care coordination and respite uptake. So if you're already on campus, I don't know if you've worked in the field, but when I worked in the field and we were trying to get some people to adult day programs, often it was difficult because then you had to schlep clothes on, you had to get them on a bus, you had to take them, as opposed to being able to walk across campus, wheel across campus. Um, so it's really nice. The other thing in terms of improving care coordination is what if people are coming from the community to the adult day program that's offered on the campus? Then they get used to that campus, and when it comes time, if they get placed in that particular campus, there's that beauty of familiarity and connectivity that they've already established. And uh, as I mentioned, a lot of them will do things together. Um, in terms of the educational placements, uh, what they found is not only the benefits of you know students being able to do their research, but um, and placements, and them being able to recruit. But certain projects that they have, whether it's younger high school students or it's university students, they found that it was a real way to fight ageism. Because when they saw people living in vibrant communities and doing things, you know, I don't know how much exposure, I don't want to generalize about generations, but sometimes people don't have the exposure to see vibrant living uh, by seniors. And um, and it was a really great opportunity to not only do research, but be, have intergenerational activities to, to see what you can learn from one another. So with the benefits come some barriers, and I've mentioned most of them along the way. We have very siloed legislation. Even though we co-locate these different pieces, there are often some regulations that are conflicting and don't work together very well. Um, and you have to make sure that you're meeting the muster of the most restrictive of the regulations that you're working uh, under, operating under. The biggest policy issue, if you think about moving on to a long-term care continuum, would you think if you live in independent living or retirement home on that campus that you should be able to move into the long-term care home? Would that make sense to be able to match, naturally move across the continuum as your needs changed? What kind of ease do you think that happens with today's Wait, placement wait lists and the equity that they're, they're saying you need to treat everybody the same. So if I particularly like Briere, 
and I put Briere as my first choice and I live in the community. And if I put Briere and I live just, you know, a hallway over, there's an argument that can be made both ways. What do you think that would be? What's the argument for keeping people on campus and being able to move seamlessly to their long-term care home? Sorry to make you participate. So continuity, familiarity, um, even even routines, right? And and especially if you have a spouse that's living an independent living, or or say you're a person that has moved there because your son has developmental delays and you're a senior and you're hoping that you can both transition at some point. So the, that is for sure the argument for the people. And, and then when they have to actually move to a different long-term care home and literally people are tr trying to, they can't afford to, the transportation, can't access transportation to go visit, whereas if, if they could visit somebody just across the hall where they live. Okay, now let's argue for the community person. The community person that wants to get into the campus and they're told no because there is a priority placement on the campus. What do you think the argument is for the people in the community? It's not fair, why? But they live there, they're going to have familiarity and continuity of care. Excellent. So I should probably repeat it again. Um, the safety needs in the community can can maybe pay, take precedence because if you have a burnt out caregiver with no supports directly available on a co-located campus, then that person's at greater risk, right? Which is where we're seeing crisis placements get priority in long-term care. So the jury's still out. Right now, there's only spousal reunification as an opportunity to bring people together. So what campuses often do is they use their own internal wait list to move people around in the components that they have control over, but they don't have control over who goes into long-term care. But what they will do is they will do their utmost, and most places would do this, but they do their very best to support people until they can actually get into that bed. And there were people in their 90s that I ate with at one home that it was a home that wasn't grandfathered. They originally moved into the housing when the housing was built, promised that they could transition into long-term care because that was the original intention of the campuses that were built back in the 80s, in the early 90s. It changed when placement coordination changed the rules, late 90s, early 2000s. So that's if, if there's something that needs to be addressed, that's probably it. Um, and and what the answer to that is, I would love to get your opinions on it because so many people have said, well, maybe every second person has to be from this campus. Well, <laughs> there's a nice lottery system there. I don't know. It's, um, and I've already mentioned about the staffing. So I'll just conclude and maybe leave a few minutes for questions in terms of, as I said, it may seem simple to try and co-locate a number of different pieces together, but it's very complex. And, and somebody in systems theory told me it's the difference between building a rocket ship and raising a child. Have you heard that analogy? So when you think about a rocket ship, it's complicated, but you can do it. You have instructions. My kid does Lego. He has instructions for crazy things. It's complicated. But when it's a campus and you're talking about human needs that are both health related and social related because we do have a blend of mixed incomes and backgrounds, it becomes a little more complex, especially with all the different policies and regulations that people have to work across. They've done pretty amazing jobs and they've had decades to figure it out. We're hoping that in researching this, we're going to help in, in figuring out how to move forward with potential scale and spread of the campus model. Because you wouldn't want to standardize it. The grassroots approaches have really met the needs of the community. And, and what would happen if the ministry started saying what a campus would be like? That's a question for the, the, the room. Like if you, if you said, this is a great model, we're going to have one in every single LIN and it's going to look exactly like this. Is there a risk to that or is that just fine because now we've got stable funding and we know we're going to have campuses? What do you think? 
Flexibility and adaptation is uh, limited that way. You're right. So it, it, it's a very interesting area to, to be looking at. And I thank you for letting me tell you about some of the results of our research. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask me now or in the future. My thoughts was, and I'm not that familiar with all the different types of thoughts and models, but, um, and I may have missed it at the beginning, but was the purpose of the research to, like, how do senior campuses compare to other housing, more innovative housing models where perhaps you have more of an intergenerational I'm so glad you asked that question. So the question for the people that are listening to the recording is how does a campus model compare with say an intergenerational model or different models of seniors housing? So I went and I presented to a family council and they said when you go I would like you to ask residents, although I wasn't allowed to formally ask residents, why aren't we doing something that's more family based? And one of the people that asked the question, it got asked by a number of people, but one of the people brought up the fact that their mother got early onset dementia. And her father was taking care of not only the mother who was declining, but also the two children. Um, and, and it was not an easy way to live, right? Because people didn't understand somebody being 40 something having dementia, nor did the children. And said that if we'd been able to be in one of those campuses, that would have been great but it's not designed, it's a senior's lifestyle model. So I think there's excellent room for considering something broader. And if you want to see one of the most amazing campuses I've ever been to, which isn't actually a campus, it's a long-term care home that operates like a campus, is the Sherbrooke Center in Saskatchewan. And I went out there for a tour. They've been highlighted on CBC millions of times, millions, well, three, that I know of, and uh, CTV. and um, they are actually in the process of developing housing that will be intergenerational, particularly for people that have children with special needs so that they can grow up in a community and, and have that intergenerational piece. Sherbrooke Center has been on CBC because they have a grade six class with the, uh, the Board of Education embedded right in the long-term care home. So they've, they've got that down. They're also an Eden principal campus, um, sorry, long-term care home, but it's hard to say that because they really are campus. Um, it's pretty amazing. So um, there are other things that are interesting that are going out, um, like co-op housing, where people are opting in, especially in, in British Columbia. Mars building, um, it's not Mars building, Mars oh, think tank center. Mars center, they've been doing a lot of really interesting research on different housing. And um, NICE. Uh, has been doing some interesting work on shared housing in people's own homes. One of the big arguments is, is how do we, like why do people even have to move in the first place? Why would they need to move to a campus, right? Because if you can actually provide, but if you think about opportunities for social isolation and we have ministries being developed on loneliness in the UK, etc., cetera, uh, there's something to be said for communal uh, opportunities to do things, whether it's living or whether it's just activity. Another interesting thing that's happening in, in uh, New Brunswick is going back to the fact that long-term care homes may not need to be a campus, but they can still serve as a community hub and doing activities there. So whether it's intergenerational activities or if it's just commuting, transporting people there for congregate dining and to go back home to sleep. That was a very long answer for your question. Yes? So the question is, is there any kind of uh, financial insurance yeah. about the housing? Um, in Toronto housing, um, in municipal housing, sorry, not Toronto, in municipal housing, um, 
I'm sure there are mitigation strategies that they have to try and help people that are rent geared to income. But I don't know if, I mean, if, if you're covered under Landlord Tenant Act, you need to pay your rent, whether it's lower or higher, you, you agree to actually pay your, your rent. Um, for people in long-term care, oh, this is being recorded. When the microphone goes off, ask me a question about um, somebody I met who was in long-term care simply because she couldn't afford to be uh, in housing anymore. Thank you once again for a really interesting talk. Can we just have a little talk? Oh, thank you very much. Um, and I just want to make a couple of announcements about upcoming talks. So this is the beginning of our winter semester um, series. Next week we have uh, Nicole Dahmer, who's a postdoc at Trent, and she's talking about making families information work visible in dementia care. Um, and then we're skipping a week because of the February break at the university, uh, February 28th. So we're mixing, also we're mixing up Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I highly recommend that you look on the Institute re website because as I'll, I'll announce, sometimes student uh, present, presenters have things come up, et cetera. So um, the 28th, we're talking about exploring and developing tools for staying engaged as we age, and that's Andrea Wilkinson, who's at the back here. Um, and Tuesday, March 5th, we've got information about LGBTQ older adults and aging with Celeste Pang. I want to announce that the March 7th one has just been canceled. We will be rescheduling it for the autumn. Um, and the uh, Philippa Gosen is going to be presenting Thursday, March 14th on environmental design, biomechanical analysis of human motion and fall prevention. Um, and the 21st, we're going to, uh, Charlene Chu is going to be presenting on a pilot study of an individualized walking intervention for functional mo mobility for p residents with dementia. And then we have uh, what end of March, March 28th, uh, we have a built environment, Jilan Zhu, who's one of a postdoctoral fellow who also completed her doctorate um, uh, in geography, but uh, is an institute uh, member. She's looking at the relationship between the built environment, active activity, participation, and healthy aging. And her last one will be by Shlomit Rotenberg in April on subjective cognitive decline. We also have, so these are all free and you're very welcome to attend. Yes, whoops, one more. Oh yes, please let, let me draw your attention to the one that's not at noon, which Tuesday, March 5th is later just because Celeste is teaching in the morning and couldn't get over here by noon. So that's another thing to pay attention to. Um, and we've been, we also have, so these are all free that I was just talking about in one hour lectures. We also have online workshops which are um, for mostly providers in the community or people with an interest um, coming up or just just started this week was grief interventions for all types of situational laws. That's by Eleanor Silverberg. Um, that's on the blue ones, which I think we, we handed out. Um, Rini Clymans is doing about a, a, a project in March or a, a workshop on how to run a caregiver support group and a variety of different modalities. She's a social worker with, with years and years of experience at Baycrest. Um, Marilyn White Campbell in mid-March is starting one on substance misuse among older adults. Um, and in April, we've got uh, Adriana Schnall. This is one of our highest demand about evidence-based strategies for supporting family caregivers. Um, end of April, beginning of May, we start with Laura Watts uh, about power of attorney and capacity and consent issues. Um, Laura was the uh, um, founding uh, founding lawyer at Elder Law, as at Elder Law Canada, so she has lots of experience in that. And um, we have then end of May we're doing beginning into June intimacy and sexual behaviors among older adults. So thank you again, Francis, for a fascinating presentation, and thank you for coming. Have a great week.